Good morning. Really good to see everybody this morning as others are filing in to worship together this morning. And on behalf of the, the church and the entire staff, we'd like to welcome each and every one of you here into God's house as we worship together. If you are visiting with us today, we are excited to have you here with us. You are our honored guests. Please make yourself at home. I will give you one little bit of warning. If you came here looking for the perfect church, you're probably in the wrong place. But if you want to stand side by side with flawed people who want to worship and praise God and serve Him, then you're definitely in the right place. And feel free to worship right along with us. In the pew in front of you, you should see a couple cards. One is for prayer requests, and the other is a Get Connected card. We would love the opportunity to pray for you and with you on any matter that, that's on your heart. Please feel free to fill this out and drop it in the offering plate as it comes by. And also the Get Connected card. Just different ways that you can get connected within all the ministries that we have here at Pine Grove. I think we're going to sing a really good song right now called What a Beautiful Name. Good morning. If you would please stand and join us. And as Mike said, this song is called What a Beautiful Name. And it has such a powerful message behind it. So as we're singing it, please just sing it to the Lord and worship Him this morning. Hidden glory 
Amen. You may be seated. Except for the kiddos. You all come on up. Come on up, kiddos. Come on over this way a little bit more. That way you can see a little bit better. Whoa. Got some visitors with you tonight or today, huh? All right. Is this everybody? All right. It's good to see you this morning. Did you all have a good week? All right, let's get them situated and then let's listen, okay? All right, well, today I want to ask you a question. Raise your hand if you have a bike, a bike or scooter, even a skateboard or rollerblade, something like that. You have three? A broken skateboard, uh oh. Okay, you got lots of bikes. Lots of cool things to ride, huh? Uh oh. <laughs> okay, whoa. All right, well, the first time, do you remember the first time you rode your bike or your scooter, whatever it might be? Were you, were you instantly a professional? Could you do all kinds of tricks and, and go off ramps and all kinds of stuff? Were you instantly a professional? Huh? You did wheelies? What? Oh, you didn't need training wheels. Awesome. Well, you did pretty good. Yeah. But did you just hop on it and go? Or did you need to think of think it through and get something? Did you have to put something on first? No? Oh, okay. So you needed you needed some protective gear, huh? Um This is Elizabeth's, not mine. Creepy. It's just a pink. It's just a pink helmet. What's creepy about that? You just must like not must not like pink, huh? Pink not your color. Too many stickers. Well, with a five year old, you gotta make it cool. You gotta make it her. She had to decorate it, okay? Way too much pink. Well, I can understand that. All right. Well, you need a helmet. Why do you need a helmet? Keep your head safe, because what's inside your head that is very important? Your brain. You got to keep that safe, okay? At your skull, absolutely, huh? They don't have helmets, and they really should try to get one. It, I know. Isn't that crazy? People in Ohio don't wear helmets when they're riding a motorcycle. That's just crazy to me. I, I would think they would want to keep their precious brain safe, okay? But. To each his own, okay? But I would think that you need to wear a helmet to stay safe. What else should you wear to stay safe? Knee pads and elbow pads, right? And I've got some right here. Knee pads and elbow pads. Anything else? What if you fall and try to catch yourself? What might you should wear? Gloves or these are cool. Um, let me see. They all look alike. Fingerless gloves. Those are cool. Those help a lot. In case you scrape your hands, right? These are wrist guards. They're kind of uncomfortable. But once you get used to them, it kind of helps in case you fall to protect your hands, right? Um, would you, do you have to wear certain kind of shoes? Yeah. Would you Would you hop on there with cowboy boots or high heels? Elizabeth would. But should you hop on there with high heels or cowboy boots or flip-flops? Tennis shoes are the best because they're flat on the bottom and they give you better grip. Barefoot. Oh, you're a daredevil. My dad has a special kind of bike where you use your special kind of shoes that clip in. Oh, that clip in? Yeah. Pastor Brian's got those. I, I'm not coordinated enough to use those because if I fall off, I can't get out of them fast enough. All right. Well, so we all agree that when we're riding a bike or a scooter or something like that or a skateboard, you need to have some protective gear on, right? Um, and you shouldn't do it without it, especially if you're going to do some tricks or something daring, right? You don't? Just a helmet? Well, you got the, the, the main part covered, okay? Well, I want to talk to you guys today about a way that we can protect our, our spiritual body, okay? Now, I know some of you have seen Pastor Brian's um, armor that he uses for Easter time, right? Um, would you like to wear real armor every day yeah. wouldn't that be cool what how'd you like to walk into school with with a suit of armor on wouldn't you be the coolest ever yeah. <laughs> clanking down the hallway right well i want you guys to think about the the armor of god the armor of god is a little bit different um is it a 
is it visible or is it invisible? We've been talking on Sunday mornings about the invisible world, our, our spiritual world. And this is another aspect or another part of our spiritual world, okay? God gave us in the book of Ephesians, he told us in chapter 6, that we need to put on, it says, so put on the, um, all of God's armor. Evil days will come, but you will be able to stand up to anything. After you have done everything you can, you will still be standing. So God gave us the spiritual armor. What, is, what are some of the parts of the armor that you see? Real quick. Vanessa, what do you see? A shield. Okay, the shield is a shield of faith. Say shield of faith. Shield of faith. Satan is crafty, okay? He likes to plant seeds of doubt in our mind and in our hearts. And, and if, if we're not careful, if we're not blocking those arrows that he can shoot at us and we don't block them with that shield of faith, because we know that God is more powerful than Satan, right? God's going to win every time. But we have to have faith in him to do it, Right? So if we have that shield of faith, we can, we can shield it from those fiery darts from the, from the devil. Okay, what else do you see? The breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate of righteousness. Now back, breastplate, yeah, it's a breastplate. It covers your chest. What's in your chest that we really need to protect? Your heart, definitely. And that breastplate of righteousness, we've got to, in our heart, we have to choose to follow God and choose to listen to, to God's choices instead of Satan's, right? So that's going to protect our heart and, and our choices. Okay, real quick, what's another one you see? The sword of the Spirit. Who knows what the sword is? We do sword drills downstairs. What's our sword? The Bible is our sword, okay? When we read the Bible and we know it and we hide it in our heart and have it ready to use, it's the most powerful weapon we can have, okay? Now, beating people over the head with the Bible is not the direction I'm going with, okay? It's over, although sometimes we feel like we need to do that, right? Because they just won't listen. But, but the, when we use God's Word to speak truth, is more powerful than any fight that we could have with our fists, right? Okay? Real quick, what covers our head? The helmet of salvation. Okay? The helmet of salvation. And we have to speak in Jesus' name against Satan so we can keep um, our head in the game, right? Okay? And there's two more things. Real quick. The belt of truth. Say belt of truth. We put that on. The belt of truth helps us um, to speak the truth in Jesus' name because Satan is the father of lies, and we have got to make sure we know God's truth. And the last thing, just like we don't wear cowboy boots or high heels when we're riding a, a scooter or a, a bike, um, the shoes of God's peace, okay? We have to wear shoes of God's peace um, because Satan tries to confuse us and worry us in our lives, but we have to have that peace of God that passes all understanding. You are nothing but your helmet. At least shorts, right? Okay, okay. All right. I know. You're exposing a lot of skin. All right. All right. So, guys, we're going to talk more about it downstairs, the, the armor of God. <laughs> okay. All right. Everybody close your eyes with me. We're going to say a prayer to ask God. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Listen. We're going to say a prayer and ask God to help us put on the armor of God every day. Okay? Let's put them down for just a minute so we can focus. Okay? All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us the protection that we need to walk safely through our daily life. Help us to make sure we always put on the full armor that you have provided for us every day when we wake up so we can fight the devil's schemes against us in this life. We love you so much, dear Lord, and we thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Very good lesson for us adults this morning, especially talking about the sword. We know the sword for a Christian is the Bible. And the question we have to answer today for each one of us are you, seeing, are you swinging a sharp sword, or is your sword rusty? And there's only one way to get the rust off of your sword, and that's to spend all the time you can in God's Word. I'd ask everybody to stand, if you would, this morning.
as we continue to worship. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song called, what, A Beautiful Name. There's something about that name. And I'd ask, I'm going to lead us in prayer here in just a second. And after we have the prayer, sing that song like you mean it. That it is, is truly a wonderful name, this person that we worship and we sing about. Our call to worship this morning comes from John, chapter 11, looking at verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then Jesus goes on to say, do you believe this? And that's a question each one of us standing here today have to answer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for this wonderful day that you've created for each one of us, for the blessings of life that each one of us enjoy. Help us not to take those blessings for granted. We thank you for your presence here with us, Lord, and we invite your spirit into our worship this day. And ask that you would have your way as we worship and we sing and try to please you. And it's in the name of Jesus, that wonderful name, that we pray. And amen. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after So well, let's do it again. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance. Father, we're so thankful and grateful to you this morning for allowing us the privilege to come to this house to worship you in spirit and in truth. Yes, Lord, we know that we try to worship you every day, but what a blessing it is to come to this house and fellowship with other people, other Christians, spreading the word of your good news of the gospel. We ask you, Lord, to bless this offering and tithes that we bring into the storehouse today. Multiply it for the upbuilding of your kingdom, and we'll give you all the praise for a glorious, glorious outcome in our community. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
Good morning. Beautiful day out here today. And I'll tell you, the song I'm going to sing is to help some people that I know that are struggling right now with the possibility of loss of loved ones and other things in their life. And you know, I've said this before, that God chooses the song that he wants me to sing for you. I had three other songs I was practicing, and I wasn't doing that good because of allergies and sinuses. And I sang this song, and John, bless his heart, said, Patty, that's your signature song. I said, well, evidently, God's wanting me to sing that on Sunday. And I tried the other song still on Saturday, and I tried them this morning. But God says, you know, I have a lot of people that's up on the mountain because everything is so good for them. And I have a lot of people who are down in the valley. I want you to sing this song, Patty. And I do what he tells me. So the song this morning is God on the Mountain. Please listen to the words and know that you are not alone, that God is with you. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain and you've got peace of mind like you've never known but then things change and you're down in the valley don't lose faith for you're never alone for the God on the mountain is still God in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right and the God of the good times is still God in the bad times the God of the day is still God in the night you talk of faith when Oh, you're up on the mountain But talk comes so easy When life's at its best But it's down in the valley Of trials and temptation That's when God Put to the test for the God on the mountain is to God in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right and the God of the good times is to God in the bad times the God of the day is still God in the night the God of the day is still God in the night good morning what is this Miss Patty you gotta take your mic with you <laughs> Yo, don't come after me I'm just picking with her okay there's a couple of things I want to talk about this morning. You guys can turn to 1 Samuel if you want to. We'll be in there somewhere in just a minute. Just locate yourself uh, really to the call of Saul and God's disappointment that, that Israel was calling for a king. But, and we're going to get to the part where uh, we need to focus on why Saul tortured himself so much. Because I think uh, we do the same thing. We dwell on certain things that are negative and we, we beat ourselves up. And we're going to try to figure out why Saul did that what Saul could have done, but also what options do we have now 
not to dwell on how pathetic we are sometimes. So, but there's something that's bothering me. But first, first I, I enjoy laughter because there's so much heartache and there's so many different things and we need to celebrate just a little bit. So we're going to cover about four or five different passages this morning in the Bible. But I have to ask you something. What's the difference between a teacher and a train? This is serious. I'm not just playing here. First of all, a teacher will tell you to chew, or spit out your chewing gum, right? But a train will encourage you and tell you to chew, 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 chew. <laughs> I promised Becky I wouldn't use those jokes anymore, but I lied. I'm sorry. All right. Now listen, hey, here's what I'm really disturbed about this morning. This morning, I didn't even see what time it was. I was looking up something, and I got a bad habit of doing some searches for my sermon notes on Sunday morning just to add some other flavor and different spins. And uh, I'm concerned. Our culture has never been really headed in the right direction as far as God goes, but it's getting worse. And so I decided, I was like, well, you know, Lucifer is the name of Satan, and it's only used one time by Isaiah, and it's in the Old Testament, and it is no other language but Hebrew, okay? Hebrew, but period. We have it in English, we have it in other languages as well, but I'm telling you, the name Lucifer is actually an, a Latin translation. It's not even the correct pronunciation of the Hebrew name for Lucifer. For so Satan, Satan's actual name is H-E-L-E-L, Hallel. That is the name of Satan that Isaiah uses, okay? The reason I tell you this, I decided to type it in. I was like, I, I almost forgot the name in Hebrew, so I typed it into Google, L-U-C-I-F-E-R, and on the entire page of the results was all about the, the show that has renewed its fifth or sixth season on Netflix called Lucifer or Fox. Not one reference to the Bible. Even though it's only used one time, and I'm sitting here looking at this, pretty soon, 50 years from now, we're going to walk up to some of our generation and we're going to say, Lucifer is the name of Satan. It's like, no, it's not. It's a TV show back in 2019. Do you understand what I'm saying here? We are losing genuineness in the authentication of what God's word truly meant. Isaiah didn't speak Latin, so he didn't say Lucifer. He said Hallel. The day that we forget these important things is the day we just might as well wipe and just walk away. And I'm also concerned because several different stories that have been shared, and there's one church where it was voted out of West Virginia Baptist Association because the pastor uh, is open homosexual, which is a sin. Sorry, it's wrong decided that uh, she was open homosexual and didn't see why she couldn't cooperate and work with the Western New Baptist Association and still live that lifestyle and lead that church. That's false teaching. They are a false teacher. They need to step down. But it bothers me because the thing is, is when they have that perspective of lifestyle and they're open to it and they're going to live it, here's the thing. They don't see a problem in it and they say, why can't we cooperate? Guys, I love God more than I love you. And I'm not going to apologize for that. But you need to have that same view. You need to love God more than you love people. Because if you do love God more than you love people, you're going to put those people first, but you're going to tell them who God is. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Did Jesus condemn homosexuality? Yes, he did. But that's not what the sermon's about this morning. That's just what's troubling me. Pretty soon you're going to have a woman, a woman wanting to marry a chandelier. There's a new story on that. You need to look it up. All right. Y'all think I'm joking. <laughs> Our culture is in bad, bad, bad shape. And it's just going to get worse. So what do we do? What do we dwell upon? Should we dwell on these negative things? Should we just bring you know, a sermon this morning and let me just preach nothing but negativity and then send you out there and say, have fun today and cry? No. We need to dwell on certain things. And for some reason, I'm thinking, maybe Confucius say to dwell on good things. Maybe I read it in a fortune cookie somewhere. I'm not real sure. But I'm sure it's written somewhere that it says dwell on things that are good, right? I'm not real sure. But let's first go to 1 Samuel. Now, I want to talk about this. Now, for several weeks, we talked about Saul, King Saul. Now, we have to understand this. Uh, within his sin and disobedience, we have King Saul. And it says here, how do we currently avoid... Saul type actions and no longer dwell on our guilt, our past sins, uh, decisions that lead to sin. And we have Saul here, he was, he was a very angry man, but he also, I think he had, you know what, he had some, some self-confidence issues, I believe. I mean, people thought he looked like a king. I mean, that's how you pick a king, right? He looks like one. You know what I thought? If, if Al Gore wasn't such a nut, 
and he grew a beard, he'd actually look like a man, I'd vote for him. Have you seen him with a beard? He looks like a dude. He's like, oh, wow, he, he looks decent. But if you, based on looks, you're going to get a brain or a skull full of mush. You guys saw here, oh, he looks like a king. He stands above everybody else. He's handsome. He's our king. And God was not happy about it. But listen to this. So how do we focus on this? We see that Saul's already a corrupted man. His heart was an issue. He already had issues. He didn't develop them. They just got worse. And his heart was really seen. So how do we remove this sin, guilt, this jealousy, this anger, this you know, type of depression? So I had to look up this word dwell. Now when I say dwelling or dwell, what do you guys think it means, dwell, to dwell? What? To hang out? What's that? Take up residence. So find a place and dwell, right? Live, slap some buttons, watch some TV, eat some popcorn, whatever, right? Yeah. So I, I looked this up. Let's look at this word. This is what happens to me on Sunday mornings when I start looking stuff up. So you look at this word. Definition, first definition. There's two definitions. The first one is live in or at a specific place. So spot on. But it's this first definition, right? So here's the second definition. Think, speak, or write at length about. So it has something to do with your mind. It's a particular subject, especially one that is a source of, get this, I love this, here it is, ready? This is the definition for dwell on, on your Google. It's a particular subject, especially one that is a source of unhappiness, anxiety, and dissatisfaction. <gasps> do you want to dwell? <laughs> you see people being dwell, like they're stressed out, it's like, what are you dwelling on? <laughs> and it's usually a negative thing. You don't see somebody walking down the street bebopping. It's like, what's he dwelling on? It's like, not dwelling. He's happy. He doesn't dwell. So it's weird. So, okay, we move on with this. And, and for some reason, we see this dwell used on and off and on. And we'll get back to that first of all. But here's we we have to focus on. Saul dwelled on disappointments within himself, but also as he continued to disappoint God and Samuel as well. So first and foremost, it's a heart condition. It's always a heart condition. You truly get to know someone when they get stuck in a position or a situation and you see their heart or their intentions. I have a bad habit of getting caught up in the moment. It was like yesterday we went to the ark, which is a massive blessing to everybody. It was a fun, fun event. But it was like herding cattle. And there were times I was headed into this area, and I was telling Karen about this this morning, and I saw it was like, uh, it was an area of dwellings of, of, of how Noah and the, the family on the ark may have lived in their separate decorated rooms. And everything short of Ikea, okay? It was in there. And I was thinking, I don't want to see that. In my mind, I was going, I don't care how they lived on the ark, because more than likely they stayed in one room. That's my opinion. They did it all the way up to the first century. Why not do it when they built the ark? But they can take their general, you know, artistic liberties and, and decorate. It's, it's neat to think about the possibility, because I may not even be right. I don't know. No one was there during that time, right? God took care of it. But I wanted to look, I was like, I want to look at the facts over here. I want to look at all these things that, that prove that these theories that man has developed in our science books uh, are false, but not only false, why do they not match up with the Bible? Well, it's because it's their own agenda. So I was wanting to get to that section. So I wanted to get out. So I'm in the moment of, I'm miserable. Why? I was like, because I got this little thin nylon rope and it's keeping me in here. And I'm just like, I'm going to, I was like, I'm free. And of course, you got somebody going, pointing you in a certain direction. You're like, oh, I got to go back this way now. And I didn't, I was in the moment because I just wanted to get out of that. So my dwelling sometimes, I dwell on, I want to get out of this discomfort. A lot of us do that. We want trials and tests to end because we're discomfortable or uncomfortable. We want it to end because we want to be comfortable. When I pray for you all, if you're in the hospital, one of the things is I pray that God brings you out of this trial, brings you back home where you are comfortable because we all want to be in that state so we look at this word dwell and it means something about emotions so we look at this it's a heart condition the hebrew understanding of the seat of emotions is the heart and if unchecked it will lead us to make life decisions based on emotions such as saw and not discernment according to the holy spirit so let's do a brief recap first uh, samuel chapter 8 verses 7 and 9 and let me read before i read that part king saul was technically israel's first king so he's technically the first king 
He came to power after a bloody and tumultuous period in Israel's history when the people were governed by various tribal chieftains known as judges. And you can read about it in the book of Judges. There you go. So you can check that out. It's the history there. All right? It tracks this, this, this progress, but also moral corruption of the Israelites, their leaders after the death of Joshua or Yahshua. With no centralized government and 200 years of poor leadership, this was a period of political and social upheaval. So the, the Jews, you know, they wanted some type of direction because without a vision, people are lost. So the Israelite people were looking for a savior who could end the strife and have marred their nation's landscape for generations. They wanted or needed a king. We look in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 7, and then skip to verse 9. The Lord said to Samuel, he says, obey the voice of the people in relation to all that they have say to you, for it is not you that they have rejected, but me. They have rejected from reigning over them. They've rejected God. He's not happy about the situation. I'm sure he knew it was coming. He's a sovereign God. But he tells Samuel, move forward. He knew who Saul was. He knew that they were about to get Saul for the next 42 years of their lives. Now then, obey their voice. Only you will testify against them and proclaim to them the judgment concerning the king who will reign over them. Samuel told him what Saul would eventually do as far as their belongings. He's like, oh, is that your cow? I need it. God did it, said, give me your best, and in return, I'll bless you for it because of obedience. Saul didn't do that. Give it to me, belongs to me. Are you going to bless me, king? No, you get to live here free. I won't hurt you until I need something else later, right? Or he wants to throw a spear at your head, which is completely plausible. Saul was the first chosen king, and if we examine his life decisions and behaviors, we may be embarrassed to admit similarities in our own lifestyles. I know some of you are like, no, I wouldn't. It's like, yeah, yeah, you do. How many of us are hot-headed, and sometimes the jealousy gets a hold of us, and we make a dumb decision, but how do we rebound from that? Do you dwell over here? I know there's times when Megan and I will have just a, a drop down, drag out fight. Yeah, we fight. It's a normal marriage, just like your all's. Well, maybe not normal, but it's a marriage just like your all's, and we'll just fight. And there's times when I know I was the butt. I'm like, I have really messed up, Lord, and I'm down there, and I'm just dwelling in my guilt. She comes down, and she goes, you're hungry? And I'm like, I shouldn't eat. I don't deserve to eat. And I, I do, I really do, I'm serious about it. She brings me a plate, and I'm just like, uh, and there's a tear. She's like, what's wrong? I was like, I can't eat this. And, and I'm eating with my tears. <laughs> and I feel that way because I feel the guilt. There's guilt there. So who do you need to talk to about the guilt? Probably your wife or spouse, whoever it is, but also God. Did you disobey God and how you treated your, your spouse? But it does bother me. I'm like, I should not eat until I figure this out. I don't know if it's connected, connected to the way I was raised, possibly. But listen to this. The whole point of exploring Saul's failures, as many as the other failures in the Bible, is to warn us. Did you know that? So that we don't repeat their mistakes. Every example, example presented in the Bible, we ought to hold captive and say, hey, listen, we shouldn't make this decision because based on this story that we learned in the Bible, that's why God gives it to us. Saul's root character flaw was a self-exaltation and self-deception. He thinks he knows better than everyone else, including God. The biggest tragedy is that he's not even aware of how horrible he could possibly be. The story shows he is completely blind to his arrogance and always believes he's the right. He always believes he's right. How many of you men, now don't, don't lie to me. Now, how many of you men at home, you have your garage set up or you have your man cave or you have a system set up with your vehicles and you won't try any other way because you feel it's the right way? If you guys don't raise your hand, you're sinning. <laughs> Growing up in the basement of my Papa's house, and I never understood, Papa's house, I'm not lying, the highest point of Papa's house was probably, here's the ground, here's the roof. That was the house. It was a big square, and it was covered with tar or pitch, was what Noah would say. And then you go into the front of it, and there's only one entrance. The rest of the entrances was where he left out four cinder blocks to put a window on several different sides. One door. Talk about a fire hazard. 
It was block on the outside and everything else was plywood with two befores. And what's funny is all of the walls had no insulation. It was just a piece of plywood that was painted yellow. The roof, which is some kind of soft material, I don't think they make anymore. And then a two before, and you saw the wire going through and there were holes drilled for the wires to go through the walls. Did you know that's the way your walls look now? But Papa left them at phase one. <laughs> He didn't complete the rest of it. I thought it was normal growing up. Hey, everybody's house ought to look like this, right? And they, there was only one door in the entire, well, two doors. Two doors in the entire house. The front door and the door to the bathroom. You had curtains for the bedrooms. And growing up, I guess, well, Papa thought it was normal. But not just this. Get this. this is, Daddy's the one that told me the story later on because kids, we just didn't understand it. You go to the kitchen if you're thirsty. And you get this little metal thing that has a bowl and attached by a handle. looks like a ladle. It's a dipper. You fill it full of well water, which tastes like copper. You take a drink and you put it back up. Everybody drank from that. You're like, yeah. <laughs> Nobody does that nowadays, right? But here's what was weird. Which side is the cold water on? On the right side? Is it? How many of you, is the cold on the right side? Everybody, let me see a hand. Wow. Not Papa's house. Remember, I'm talking about Saul, who always thought he was right. Papa put his cold water on the left. Darren, you'd love that because that's left-handed stuff, right? I got to wondering about this. Because Daddy told me later on, one of the biggest drop-down dig-out fights he's ever had with his daddy was over the fact that he put the cold and hot water on the opposite sides. He walks in there and gets a pitcher of water. He's like, Daddy, why do you got the hot water on the wrong side? Who said it's on the wrong side? And Daddy's like... Everybody? <laughs> Papa said maybe they're wrong. So I looked it up. In the olden days, most sinks had a single pump for cold water on the right. To accommodate the right-handed majority, Darren, who else is left-handed? We all love you, you're blessed. When dual temperature faucets appeared, the cold water stayed on the right while the hot water occupied the left. You're like, oh, big deal. No, 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 listen. The Uniform Plumbing Code, they're all capital letters here, now requires that faucets shall be connected to the water distribution system so that hot water corresponds to the left side of the fittings. You're like, okay, no big deal. No way. Designated as an American national standard, the Uniform Plumbing Code is a model code developed by the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials. Are you still hanging with me with this? This is ridiculous. Now, wait a minute. And I say, to govern the installation and inspection of plumbing systems as a means of promoting the public's health, safety, and welfare. So, Papa's house is now condemned as being unsafe. The UPC is developed using American standard institutions. Now, say with me again, the consensus developed procedures. The process brings together volunteers representing a variety of viewpoints and interests to achieve consensus on plumbing practices. Did you think it would be this technical? I'm not done. The UPC is designed to provide consumers with safe and sanitary plumbing systems while at the same time allowing latitude for innovation and new technologies. The public at large is encouraged and invited to participate. Open consensus and code development processes. You can show up at one of these events. This code is updated every three years. A code development timeline and other relevant information are available at the website. So really, Daddy had a good argument. He could have read all three of these paragraphs and Papa still would have went, they're wrong. Because he felt he was right. What I want to know is, who thought it was right to put the toilet two feet from your shower? So while you're drying off, you're wiping down your toilet. To me, that's unsanitary. Put that toilet in the basement in a closet somewhere, right? With a massive exhaust fan for some of us. But you look at this and you're like, okay, Saul always thought he was right. He even declared that when, when David went into this fortress and he was closed up in there with his men, he turned to God and said, the God, God has handed him to me. I'm going to go get him. God never told him that. Saul thought he was right. Saul threw a spear at David's head three times. Thought he was right. He threw a spear at his own son Jonathan's head. Thought he was right. No one told him he was wrong. They probably tried to, but he was right. You could not change his mind. Now think of you. If you had an introspection and you're evaluating your life, are there different areas in your life which you refuse to allow God to have control of because you look at God and say, I got this, I'm right. It's 
self-exaltation, or exaltation, self-deception, we can all relate to. Once you pass this initial sinner's prayer, we have to ask ourselves, how do we fix our heart and mind relationship? See, once, once we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, what do we focus on after Christ? Shouldn't it still be Christ? We tend to get people to the point of the cross and the point of salvation into relationship with Christ, but, but then what? We're like, figure it out. And you wonder why they get corrupt by men's views, men's values, which are not God's. Since our relationship began with confession, guess what, folks? Confession becomes our filter through which our connection with God gives us access, but it's through Christ. And it remains through Christ. I mentioned to you the, the pastor of this church who thinks that her lifestyle is more important than her calling as a shepherd. If she went to God and she, can, and she prayed and she confessed, I guarantee she would see, her, see that she's wrong, especially that lifestyle. And no matter what, 20 years from now, it's going to be harder. If I say that in front of you 20 years from now, there's going to be some of you that walk out. There's half of you right now that are still unsure that kind of want to walk out because I tell you homosexuality is wrong. Because society's telling you it's okay. Guess what on, on, the, on the skirt tails of accepting homosexuality lifestyle? Guess, on the, guess what's on the, the skirt tails? Y'all know what it is? Pedophilia. Pedophilia. Why? Because pornography is so easy to get to in your phones, game consoles. If you can search, you can get it. And if you don't realize it's corrupting our moral fabric, then you're not even focused on the right problems. And Hollywood's the worst. I was watching a sh show here recently, and I was really watching it to try to figure out what's the spin. And it's like all the characters, the main characters, are absolutely corrupt. They're, un they're dishonest. They steal. They cheat. Sex is running rampant. And there's only two main characters in there that are actually decent. But the whole show revolves around these corrupted people. And it makes absolutely no sense. The people that wrote these, I don't even know why he did it. Not only that, I can't tell you, watching a show, I cannot remember a time that I've heard the name Jesus used in slang more than I have recently noticed. You think that's, that's just random? Do you think it is? Do you realize California is uh, oppressing Christianity right now? We better wake up. Remember the last sermon I preached to you? Now David stood on the battlefield in front of the Philistines and he pulled the sword of Goliath out. Where's that? Where's God's warriors that we can stand up in front of these people telling us we're wrong and we're not. We're not bigots. We're not hostile towards you. We love you. We want you to know who Jesus Christ is. He'll point you in the right direction. You receive the Holy Spirit. You'll begin to live the life that God wants you to live. And it is one that we hold to our values. It's not because, it, well, it's something that Little House on the Prairie taught. And we just need to move on because we're changing. Wrong. Our society changes, but the Word of God, what? Never changes. Never has. Never will. No matter how many times you take it back to the original language, Hebrew, Aramaic, even the Greek, it still says the same thing. So what do we do when we begin to just dwell on our sinful lives and we get depressed and we're like, well, what am I supposed to do with this, Lord? Why do I feel so bad about myself? Look, 2 Corinthians, I promise it'll be happy in the closing, but look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. You love this. You have to absolutely love the Word of God when it comes to these things because I'm telling you guys, this stuff is powerful. I don't know how it doesn't impact you anymore. And when it, this, just reading this stuff ought to move you to walk out and like, yes, God's Word's truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1-4. through 4. Paul is defending himself here. He's telling the church of Corinth, which is around a lot of paganistic uh, 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 temples to false worshiping gods and, and also prostitution. It's running rampant in Corinth. He decided to plant a church there. There's not a, there's not a sane person that would have done that today. It had to be by the power of God. He says this, 
Therefore, since we have this ministry, this ministry based on Jesus Christ, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart. But he says this, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. What things hidden because of shame? Guys, will you do me a favor? You don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell your spouse. You don't have to tell your children. The position that you're in right now, the lifestyle that you're living right now, do me a favor and just say, I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to take myself out of the position of the life that I'm living, all the decisions that I'm making, make a list of whatever it is, and try to remove yourself from that position and look into the position that you're living. And from the perspective of what we're here saying, does this please God? Write it all down. Does it please God? Does it honor God? The way you eat, the way you exercise, the way you sleep, the way you talk to people, your relationships, everything. And if you can't legitimately say that this lifestyle here that I'm currently living, if this lifestyle right here does not please God, then you need to realize those are the things that are hidden and you feel shame for them. So what do you do? You confess them. That's what Paul's saying here. Let's get it. He says this, renounced the things hidden because of shame. We only feel shame because sin becomes obvious. Adam and Eve, butt naked in the Garden of Eden. No shame whatsoever until the moment they disobeyed God. Then what did they feel? Shame. You know what's great about this though? Can I just tell you this? We love this, the Avengers. We like the idea of taking vengeance. We got this ghost writer in the Marvel Universe called Spirit of Vengeance. Vengeance belongs to God. Do you know why? Because he's the first one that had wrongdoing done against him. That's why. So right from the beginning, everything throughout our lives and throughout the cre creation of humanity, vengeance belongs to God because he's the first one that was offended. Garden of Eden. And until he receives vengeance, you don't take vengeance for yourself. You're not supposed to because it belongs to God. Let's move on with this. Where was I at? All right. It says this, verse 2. He says, but we have, we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness and adulterating the word of God. I promise you that that church that was voted out of the Western Union Baptist Association, they get to this verse and they will skip it. Because if you're adulterating the word of God, you're saying, my lifestyle is acceptable to God. Let's put it in there somewhere, adulterating the word of God. Paul did not. He preached Jesus, and Jesus was the way. That was it. But by the manifestation of truth, condemning ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. If you get people tapped into their conscience sake for spiritual warfare, and they go to God and they pray, then you've won them. Because the Holy Spirit gets them. Not you. Your job is to present the gospel. Holy Spirit convicts and saves. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. So we let me look here. Where did I leave off at? Every man's conscience at verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. It's in reference to Moses. Coming off the Mount of Sinai and his face was glowing. And it says this. In whose case the God of this world was, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of glory of Christ who is the image of God. That's a fact. Some of you may doubt the man Jesus. Historical Jesus is what most of them call him because they don't believe in the Jesus, the image of God. But they'll tell you a man named Jesus existed. They'll tell you he had a following. I looked up another definition this morning on a dictionary. And I won't, I'm not telling you the name because I don't want to promote him. 11 billion people reached by this website. And for some reason, a term specifically to do with the Old Testament Hebrew Bible eventually leads you into Islam. I took screenshots on my phone because I couldn't believe it. Why? 7th century, 700 years after the birth of Christ, and even more hundreds of years before the term that I looked up in the Old Testament to be used. And for some reason, they connect it to Islam. And it says, Islam is not a Sunday religion. It is a lifestyle. They didn't say Muslims believe. They said Islam is. So I thought I'd do a test. I'm going to type in Christianity and Jesus. 
Christians believe, Christians believe, Christians believe, Christians believe, Christians believe. Not facts. They're not even talking about the man Jesus existing. Christians believe. Do you see how they're lumping it into a category? Now, I don't have a problem with it. I'm a, I'm a Christ follower because of Jesus. But when you look up stuff like this, and it leads you into thinking that, oh, only Christians believe that. So the world doesn't. But you look up Islam, and it says it's a fact. Islam is a, is a religion that doesn't meet just on Sundays, but it is a lifestyle. Isn't that what Christianity is? I thought it was. I'm confused. You know what the problem is? The people that own the website, guys. You think they're Christian? I don't think so. They used to tell you, be careful what printed material you read. Did you know you can get a Queen James? <gasps> I have a feeling I know a church that uses that one. <laughs> That's a mean knock. Forgive me, Lord. I'm sorry, but it makes me angry. Okay, let's move on here. Let's get to something fun. Self-exaltation, self-deception can create blindness. So Satan is able to hold a Christian in bondage and self-absorption. So we see Saul here. Saul was blinded by this. How do we take precautions? Because Satan will grab you in a headlock. He's got you you know, in depression. He's got you basically rendered helpless. You're down there thinking, I can't forgive myself. But God has. We'll get to that in just a second. God has forgiven you. And you've already confessed those sins. We talked about that. You confess those sins. God will forgive you, but you can't forgive yourself. So Satan has you down here. And he's, he's loving it. He's like, yeah, why? Because you're not doing anything for God. Satan would love you to stay down there. Not to get up. Fight the good fight. Run that race for the crown of righteousness. Amen? He wants you there. And all along the Holy Spirit's like, I'm bigger than this. <laughs> Holy Spirit saying, I'm bigger than this. I'm bigger than this guy. I'm bigger than your sins. I'm bigger than anything you can ever face. And you're laying there and I'm in the corner cheering you on. How come you haven't tapped into that? I see God referring back to, you go right back to this, guys. In your lives, if you don't take advantage of God in your life and the Holy Spirit that he has given you, he's basically looking at you and saying this, obey the voice of the people in relation to all that they say to you, for it is not you they have rejected, but me they have rejected. Every time you decide not to tap into God's strength, not to tap into God's word, he's saying, you're rejecting me. If I told you my word is good, if I told you my, my word would bless you, if you obey me, I will take you in places that you need to go into for me, and you're absolutely going to love it. Though it may be hard, you're going to be blessed. If you don't do that, God's saying, you have rejected me. Why? Because you think you got a better will than his. I've got this figured out. I don't need to pray about it. Again, how do you take precautions? Look back. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, again, says, Renounce the things hidden because of shame. That is confession. That leads you straight into confession. You confess it before God. Guess what? 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. These are not my words. This is what happens when you confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, that him is God. And his word is not in us. So if we confess our sins, not just will he forgive us. Get this. The character of God, faithful and righteous. Guess what he cannot do? God cannot contradict his own characteristics. God cannot be unrighteous. God cannot be unfaithful. God cannot lie. It's not in his character. He will not lie. He will not abandon you. And he will always encourage you. And I'm reminded also, you don't have to go there. I don't think I gave this to you, John, but it's Luke chapter 7, verse 47. We're like the woman who was forgiven much, amen? And therefore she loved much. For the reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. I'll bring us to a close, but I want you to listen to this. You ladies can come on up if you want. 
This is just a quote. This is not scripture yet. We're going to get to the scripture, and it's absolutely amazing, but listen to this. We must take control of our minds and reform the minds that we think about good things. It is not that we minimize our sins. You're not supposed to minimize your sins. I'm not telling you just to forget about them and don't, don't think about them. Listen to this. We don't minimize them, but rather we choose not to dwell there. Don't set up camp there. Don't hang out there. To dwell on Jesus is life. To dwell on sin is death. So whenever the thought of the sin returns to your mind, do this. Do not let it stay there, but rather use that moment to trigger a praise to God. Why? Because God's the one that's pointing it out in your life. The Holy Spirit's convicting you. This is sin. You say, thank you, Lord. I will do my best not to go that route. You know exactly how your mind thinks. You you know exactly where the pitfalls are. Don't go there. Stay out of that. (laughs) Yesterday, I drove drove the van down and back. What, four-hour trip? I got back in my, I'm back at the house, and I'm miserable. I'm tired. My head hurts. My wife comes and gives me a hug, and she's like, thank you for staying calm. <laughs> I was, but she don't know the war within. That was a bear, let me tell you. All right? <laughs> it was. I'm not lying. It was tough. But it did, you know, it did good. It did good. God, God, I think, was delighted in my obedience. <laughs> So again, whenever we think of sin and it triggers that, just help, help focus on praise to God. I leave you with this. You know, Paul wrote a letter, and I've heard Chuck Swindoll preach about it. It's promoting laughter and joy in serving God. Paul's letter for this to rejoice is Philippians. You need to check out the Philippians. It's a fun letter. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. You know, I made fun a minute ago. I think Confucius say, dwell on good things. No, he didn't. That's baloney. Paul tells us here in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. How often? (laughs) Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. He says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. Do you realize how many terms he's using there to talk about your psyche? It's not by random chance. God made you. He knows how your mind works. Comprehension, anxious. Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, the way you think, rejoice. Don't be anxious for these things. Verse 8, finally, brethren, this is important. This is the conclusion. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good of good repute, If there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Amen? Dwell on these. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God... God, we do have to be aware of where our lives are headed and where our culture is headed. And I pray, God, everybody in here becomes prayer warriors for the direction of our country and the moral fabric which we so desperately cling to. Help us, God, dwell in those terms that are pleasing to you so we can honor you, Lord, in whatever it may be. Help us, God, make good decisions. Help us, God... Help us have a plan for each and every day. If we know it's going to be a rough day, help us, God, get up an hour earlier. Have some prayer. Have some Bible study. Apply it to our lives. Be prepared for that day because it's going to come at us. I ask you, Lord, to continue to bless us, to allow us to examine your word, to expound upon it so that we can apply it to our lives. And God, I pray someone in here has never accepted your son as Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray God they do it before they leave today. It's paramount 
to them being able to evaluate their lives. They cannot do it outside of confessing Christ as Lord and accepting him into their lives. God, I pray that they're able to do that before they leave. I pray, God, once they do, but they become warriors for you. And they become this person that is so loving to you because of what they have been forgiven. And they can walk away from their old lifestyle and see this brand new life before them. And it's clearly laid out for them because you're going to bless them with it in their obedience. I pray, God, for the the Christian who is struggling because of sin that is still in their lives or it's connected to some historical habitual sin. I pray, God, that they can forgive themselves once they ask you for forgiveness. I pray, Lord, you give them comfort, you give them peace, you give them satisfaction with the fact that, God, you're going to bless them as well. And they can seek that crown of righteousness if they just continue that good fight. They continue to deny themselves whatever lifestyle that is in contradictory to you, Lord. I pray that they can walk away from it. And they choose the lifestyle that you have blessed. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this morning of worship as we continue through a song. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us stand. There's room at the cross for you. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide. sufficient for me and deep is its fountain as wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have found him a friend and have turned from the sins they have sinned, the Savior still. Before it's too late, there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. And there's room at the cross for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we leave here and we go throughout our day, I pray, God, that you convict us in our interactions with those that we run into. I pray, God, that we can be the light to those that need to see the light, that we can be comfort to those that need comfort. But also, Lord, help us, God, lead them into your truthfulness into your word into a relationship with Jesus Christ help us God be careful how we interact with them keep us on guard Lord to protect the faith which we so we so importantly keep close to our hearts I pray God in this world that this seems to want to diminish your existence I pray you allow our light to shine even more Keep us, Lord, encouraged. Keep us strong. Keep us faithful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, here I am in a river of questions. Can I pour my heart out to a listening ear? 
see this life It's valleys and mountains And I think of all the roads That brought me here Oh, that brought me here Well, I question my reasons This life I'm living I question my ability To judge wrong from right I question all the things I've ever called certain My race, my religion, my country, my mind But the one thing I don't question is you You really love me like you say you do And the one thing I don't question is you You really love me like you say you do so hold me Cause I need you to hold me Well I question significance Meaning and relevance Does the work I'm doing Really matter at all I question my friendships Alliance, dependence Who will still be here When I fall but the one thing I don't question is you You really love me like you say you do Yeah, the one thing I don't question is you You really love me like you say you do So hold me doesn't change only one thing stays the same all I know at the end of the day is your love remains and the one thing I don't question is you you really love me like you say you do yeah the one thing I don't question is you you really love me like you say you do so hold me I want you to hold me doesn't change only one thing stays the same all I know at the end of the day is your love remains and the one thing I don't question is you you really love me like you say you do you're the one thing I don't question is you you really love me like you say you do you really love me like you say you do you really love me like you say you do